Amen. Would you please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 as we focus again on verse 28. If you'd like to get ahead, you can also open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and Galatians chapter 6, and a Bible study that I've entitled, Yes, God is Working Even in That, Part 2. It goes together with our time last time as we were encouraged that God is working even in that, because that's the comfort that we find from Romans 8, 28, that you might be here today and you say, wait a minute, Ed, are you saying that God is working even in this? And the answer would be yes. As a believer in Jesus Christ, God is working even in that to bring about it as it is this day for his glory and your good. Even as everything around us swirls in confusion and pain, difficulty and uncertainty, God is still on the throne. He's alive, loving us, working through these things to bring it about for his purposes. There's a plan for your life. You could say that God has a purposeful plan for your life, and that nothing is wasted by God, because it's true. Things can get real tough. Things don't line up the way that we had expected, or we had planned, or anticipated. Then before you know it, life can get so difficult and so hard that it feels like there are times when we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, and it's just heavy. I mean, how many of you today, by a show of hands, feel like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders? And so you can see that there's a few among us that things are so difficult right now, even as we inch up to the holidays, that it just feels like you're carrying the weight of the world. It's so heavy. In our church, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our community, We are surrounded by hurting people. We're surrounded by those going through great, difficult times. Those that are physically hurting, those that are emotionally torn up, those that are financially burdened. You you might even respond to say, well, Ed, I didn't know that. Now, if you've been with us for the last eight weeks, you really can't say that because that's been the banner of which we've flown over these Bible studies, that the people that you're sitting next to the people that you live with, the people that you work with, the people that you study with, everyone's going through something. And some, as we've seen, feel like the weight of the world is on their shoulders even today. But if your response was, wait, you know, I didn't know that, Ed. Let let me respond by saying, shouldn't you know that, believer? Shouldn't you know? Shouldn't you walk around this world with a heart that cares one that's sensitive to the weaknesses and the difficulties of others? Shouldn't you know the things that are going on with the people that you're connected with? And you might say, well, wait a minute, Ed. That's your job. You're the pastor. And the other pastors of the church, that's your jobs. To which I would say, you're partially right. You're right. It is our job. And we do care. And we are interested. And we spend a lot of our time praying and seeking God for those that are hurting, those that need a touch of encouragement and strength from the Lord. But it's not exclusively our job. It's not exclusively. It's our job collectively as the church of Jesus Christ. We should be the most caring and the most loving and the most generous people on the planet with our time and our talents and our treasures, especially to those that are hurting, to those that are carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders. We should be praying for discernment that the manifestation of the Spirit of God would open up in us in discernment, that we might be able to see on their face or in their, the way they walk or how they're acting an opportunity to step into their lives. It's not just the pastor's job. It's for all of us. We're called alongside each other to help, which is what I want to show you in Galatians chapter 6. Notice with me Galatians chapter 6 in verse 1. It says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work and then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another 
for each one shall bear his own load. Each one should bear his own load. In verse 2, it says that we're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's God's call in our lives, that we might come alongside one another and help bear the burdens that folks are carrying. You know, a weight in our lives is made half as heavy. The loads in life are so much lighter when a brother or sister comes alongside to help us carry them along. What a great opportunity that we have to step into people's lives. Now, I know that those of you that have the weight on your shoulders, you feel like, you know, you can't help anyone right now. Things are too hard. Things are too difficult. Things are, are very difficult for you right now. You go, how could I possibly help anyone? Well, listen, that's the perfect time to step into someone's life. Not only do they, do they need you, but you need them to come alongside and serve someone in their pain helps to relieve some of the pressure. When you step into someone's life and you're open to the work of the Holy Spirit, it's amazing the comfort and encouragement that comes as you step to help someone else. You can't wait for the pain to go before you start serving the Lord. Some of you right now listening to me, you're you're saying, look, whenever, when this pain goes away, then I'll start serving. When this difficulty passes, then I'll step in. When this situation is gone, then I'll start caring. Listen, it's possible that the situation you're in will never pass. And you find yourself becoming so self-absorbed and so self-centered that things just get worse for you and not better because it begins to smother your faith and trust in God. One of the greatest ways to step outside of our own pain and suffering is to step into someone else's and watch him use you in amazing ways. Bear one another's burdens. But then notice in verse 5, each one shall bear his own load. To those studying the Bible and paying attention to these, you may come back and say, wait a minute, that sounds like a little bit of a contradiction. In verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. And then in verse 5, he says, each one shall bear his own load. But, But Paul is using different words here to describe different things. For example, in verse 2, bear one another's burdens, that word literally refers to, person, to a person taking a hit in the chest or to be punched in the gut. You know, those of you that have been punched in the gut, you understand what a time of crisis that really is. When you're punched in the gut, your life has been reduced to one thing and one thing only, and that's what? The next breath. I need the next breath. I can't breathe. You know, you're, when you're punched in the gut, you're not thinking about the mortgage. You're not thinking about the flat tire. You're not thinking about your career. You're not thinking about the difficulties of life. You've got one thought. I need the next breath. Somebody help me. I can't breathe. And if I can't breathe, I don't know what's going to happen. And it's the next breath. Well, life can be like that, can it? Life can punch you in the gut so that the situation is so hard and so difficult for you that it's reduced you down just to one thing. I can't breathe. I don't know how I'm gonna make it. And when people face that kind of difficulty, they need help. They need help to come alongside and help them bear the burden. Whereas in verse five, when it says, for each one shall bear his own load, the word there for load literally speaks of a soldier's pack. It just speaks to what a soldier would take in his backpack. We're like your kiddos. You set your kiddos up, you give them a backpack, and they're to carry their own load. They're to carry their own load. You know, you, would, you, you put your, uh, a blanket and a stuffed animal in your kid's backpack, and you put it on their shoulders. Oh, daddy, daddy, it's so heavy, it's so heavy. It's just a backpack, bro, with a stuffed animal. Carry it. You can do it. It's going to be okay. What we, talk, we, what we call that within adulthood is responsibility. What the Bible is saying is we should all be responsible for our lives. We should all take responsibility for our lives. We're not to be, as believers in Jesus Christ, those that are irresponsible, always wanting someone to take just what is normal responsibility in our lives. We're to carry our own load. We're to live our own life as unto the Lord. We're to to live in such a way where, well, you know, we, we are to reject the attitude of entitlement, where we think everyone should do something for us. We are to reject the attitude of entitlement because what Jesus did is he replaced that attitude of entitlement with a proper attitude of what? Servanthood. We're to be servants. We're to give our lives in some humble servitude to Jesus Christ. That if we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves. 
And so both of these go together. You know, for those of you that have the weight of the world, you have a friend that carries your burden. By faith in Jesus Christ, what does he do? He invites you and he says, you come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. We don't use heavy laden very much, so let's just replace that. Come unto me, all you who are weary and feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You come to me, Jesus says, and I'll give you rest. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say come to the church or come to a pastor or come to a friend. True release, help, and comfort comes through a relationship in Jesus Christ and him alone. Be responsible for your life, but also know that there are those that get punched in the gut every once in a while. Sometimes punch after punch, where a person feels like they're getting kicked when they're down. And we shouldn't be people who are always trying to get someone else to carry our pack. We need to be those that are spiritual. And he even gives an example, too, in verse 1. He says, especially those that have been kicked down because of their own sin. He says, you guys that are spiritual, restore a brother. We as the church of Jesus Christ should outlive the bad reputation that other generations have given us that we kick our brothers and sisters when they're down. That's not the heart of God. He picks us up. Though a man falls seven times, he'll rise again. We're not to kick each other when we're down. We're to help him. That word restore in Galatians 6.1, it's a medical term. It literally means to restore a broken bone. It, it, means, it means to set it back straight. And that's the heart of God. For us. Occasionally, folks in, in the church will have their own burdens and their own difficulties. And then some huge situation comes upon them. We should love them enough to say or to text or to email or to call and say, you know, I see it's heavy for you. I see that it's bringing you down. I see that this situation's causing you to veer off and wander away. Let me pray for you. Here's a scripture God gave me. How can I pray for you? How can I help? And watch God do wonderful things. And one of the things as we offer help to someone, one of the tools that we'll use is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Some of you, that's the only tool that you have, but it's a great tool to have. It's intended to comfort us and encourage us. The truths that we saw last time are just so glorious. Like Romans 8, 28 takes us into the heavenlies. It takes us into the throne room of God. It takes us in to see the inner workings of his sovereignty as nothing is wasted by him. So in our overview last time, we were greatly encouraged. Today I want to be encouraged by taking the verse that's before us phrase by phrase. And and let's allow it and the weight of what Paul is saying here, the Holy Spirit speaking through him to to strengthen us today. And so if you're taking notes, come back with me to Romans chapter 8. Let's look at this phrase by phrase. In verse 28 it says, and we know. That's number one, we know. We know. Paul uses this phrase about 30 plus times in his writings. And he uses a tense in the original Greek language that might be translated, we know that we know that we know. This is a statement of certainty and assurance and confidence. Just like I'm sure there's things in your life right now that you could say without a doubt, I know that I know that I know. If someone tried to come and talk you out of it, you go, no way, I know this to be true. If someone tried to offer you bait and say, oh no, that's not, you'd say, absolutely, I know it. I know it by truth. I know it by experience. Away with your lies. That's what Paul's saying here. I know that I know that I know this to be true. Christianity is not some philosophical answer to life's issues, you know. It's not a philosophy. Christianity is not just a set of teachings, a few moral teachings from a very moral teacher, some guy named Jesus Christ. That's not Christianity at all. Christianity is certainty. It's assurance. It's confidence in the person and the work of Jesus Christ who was born and lived and died and he rose again from the dead. He's alive right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father coming back, ready at just the right time to return for his saints, to fulfill all promises that were made in the scripture that are yet unfulfilled. We're waiting for their fullness. Christianity is a certainty that we have the word of God that speaks to us and brings life and strength. It's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. There are things that are certain and we know just 100% to be true. As we've been taught many times, when we face those things that we don't understand, 
And it's times of pain and trials and difficulties that we just don't understand. We just don't, it, it's times of trials and difficulties where we begin to ask questions, why God? Why me, God? Why this, God? I don't understand. I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand why it's happening to me or to me. I don't understand. It's important in those times of pain and trial when you lack understanding, when you don't understand, to fall back on the things that you do understand. Well, what do we understand about God that are absolutely true? Well, we know that God is love and that he loves us. We know that God cares. We know that God is faithful. We know that God keeps his promises. We know that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us. And so in those times, you know, if you were to come to me today as a pastor and say, Ed, this is my situation, can you explain it to me? Most likely that's impossible. I'm not going to be able to explain it because I don't know what's happening in your life. Even if you gave me all the facts, I still don't know what God is doing and what he's allowing in your life. But even if I were able to explain it to you, you still wouldn't be satisfied. Because if I explain it to you and say, well, this is what God's doing, this is what God's doing, this is what God's doing, and then you would answer, well, that, that, that's not fair. And it would take you down another path because what you're seeking for comfort and ease, what you're seeking for comfort and ease is an explanation. But the Bible says this, we don't live by explanations, we live by faith. And we trust God even in the darkness. We trust God even in the fog. We trust God even when things are disorienting. And we don't quite see what the future holds and we don't quite know what's going to happen and we don't know how this is going to work out. We walk by faith and not by sight. God has proven himself in the past. God is going to prove himself through this. And if he gives us a future and we face another situation, he's going to prove himself through there. When we come up against those things that we don't understand, we need to fall back on the things that we do understand. Not demanding an explanation because explanations will not satisfy but rather responding in faith as God is using this situation. We know, we know. That's true, there are things that we just don't know. We don't have every answer that we're seeking right now, especially in relation to the pain and the problems and the sorrows you're in right now. But it's important that we not give up the things we know just for a few things right now that we don't know. And one day it'll all be revealed and explained to us in the presence of the Lord. But today... I don't always understand the trials. I don't understand some of the things I'm personally going through today. This is not just a Bible study to you, it's a Bible study to all of us. I don't understand some things, it just don't make sense. It's just not how rational people that say they're godly behave, I just don't get it. But in the reality, I don't, see God's, I don't, I don't always see God's hand working behind the scenes, I don't always get it, you don't always get it, but I go through them and I trust in the Lord and I believe in whom I haven't seen yet because his joy becomes my joy and I come back to Romans 28 and I can agree with Paul, I know. There's so much about God I do know and I'm gonna trust him through the pain. Number two, notice, the second phrase that he uses is that all things, all things. Don't read that most things. Don't read that some things. Don't read that and we know that all things almost sort of except this thing. It is all things. All things work together. The truth is that God is working in all things in our lives. That the work of God is all-encompassing. Paul isn't saying that God's going to keep you from pain, but that even if you experience pain, God's going to use it. Now, I have to say, if you don't really believe this, if you don't really believe this, if this is something that you really don't think is true, I am certain that the people closest to you can tell. They can see it on your face. They can see it in your actions. Like if you don't believe this, that all things, if you would read this for some things or most things, then the people closest to you realize that. They see that in your life. If we had the chance to spend some time with you, we'd learn just how very mad you've become, how very bitter you've become, or upset, how manipulative you are now, how faithless you've become. We'd see that your relationship with Jesus has turned into anger and frustration over some of the all things in your life. It could be present. It could be something in the distant past. But either way, if you don't believe all things, it's affecting your relationship with God and therefore affecting your relationship with others. Here's the root of the problem. 
The root of the problem is that you don't believe that God works all things. That's the root. It's a faith issue. And then you just have that one thing or that one situation or two that you say, oh no, God can't possibly work in this. He can't possibly use this. You might even, even, you might even say, if I were God, I would. And all the while, what God is teaching you, he's teaching you and me two things. We're to wait and watch. That's what he's teaching. You're to wait and watch. This is what the Bible says in Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. What are you waiting for? But strength from the Lord. For what? To watch how he's going to work it out. You've got to wait. Wait. Hang in there. Slow down. Wait for the watching. Wait while you're watching for God to work it out. Psalm 37, 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I actually missed up the verses here. Let me read it to you. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the men who bring wicked schemes to pass. So what is he saying? He's saying, focus on the person. No, he's not saying that at all. He says, focus on the Lord. Don't worry about people. God will sort that out. You keep your eyes on the Lord. Yeah, but he's causing me so much pain. You trust the Lord. Yeah, but you don't know what she's doing. You trust in the Lord. Do you really think that your words and your manipulations, do you really think that's stronger than God? Do you really think you have the solution? Does the verse say that you're working all things together for the good? You can't. If the verse was written for you, it'd say you work all things together for bad. Because that's who you are and who I am. No, it's all things. The Bible says in Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Watch. Wait and watch as God weaves this situation into the fiber of your life. It's not fate, and it's not destiny, but the personal care of a loving, sovereign God. Number three, first, number one, we know. Number two, all things. Number three, work together. Work together. Like the recipe we looked at last time. Our end goal is a nice lemon cake. That's the end goal. But along the way, we have to have the ingredients. Each ingredient is needed in the right amounts, mixed in the right way, with the right amount of heat and time. And God works together all the ingredients that the sum is greater than all of them individually. And it's just not possible for most of the ingredients to be enjoyed. I hope none of you did this to your kids. I didn't get any emails and no kids tattled on you, so I don't think anybody did. But for dessert, one of your dinners this last week, you said, okay, kids, I was in a Bible study and I want to give you dessert. Here's a cup of flour. Enjoy. You know, that kid's going to be so upset, probably going to throw it, then get in trouble, and the whole house is crazy, and now it's Ed's fault. It's not Ed's fault because we don't give kids flour because it's nasty and it's disgusting by itself, tasteless, dry. And if, and if, it's, not, if it's not flour, then go ahead and take the six eggs and separate them, whites and yolks, and drink them and enjoy them. And that's just nasty. Hardly anybody does that. Just a few people at the gym. That's it. And I don't even understand why. You can get protein and peanut butter if you want it, you know? Do it something that's tasty. And then there's the cream of tartar. Nastiness. Bitter. So I was up early this morning. I was working out up early, and I had, I had the food channel on. Why? I don't like the food channel, but like that was on this morning. And they were making this huge gingerbread house down at the Great Wolf Lodge. I think the one in Colorado Springs. I'm not sure. Huge one, life size. And so they got the guy in the kitchen. And they're showing you all the ingredients and all the gingerbread that's needed and the bricks. And, and then he makes this white substance. It's the substance that's going to hold it all together. And so he pours this in and he pours that. And I actually didn't hear all the ingredients until he got to this big container that he called cream of tartar. So I'm going to write a letter and say, you were, you're pronouncing it incorrectly. Later, I'll email him. It's cream of tartar is what it is. 
And it was about this much he was pouring into the big thing. And this is what he said. He said, yeah, you put it in because it helps to make this, uh, this icing like cement. Imagine that. When you make a cake, you're putting cement in your stomach. <laughs> and I hope you don't eat that all by yourself because who knows what that would come. You just took the container. But it's needed if you want to get the cake. It's needed if you want to build the gingerbread house. It's needed. You don't want it on its own, but mixed together with the sugar and with the lemon peel and with the eggs and the flour and everything else. Well, isn't that like life? God is working together the ingredients of your life that some of them by their own and on their own are just plain nasty and disgusting and not pleasurable. God takes the good and he takes the bad and everything that even we would consider neutral in our lives and works them together for the good. Mixed up, sometimes it feels like life, like the beaters of life are just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And sometimes the heat's turned up in our lives. Yeah. But there's a finished product at the end. And if you want the lemon cake of life, you got to go through the process. And we know what the process is. God's making something far more delightful than lemon cake. He's conforming us into the very image of Jesus Christ. There is a transformation taking place in our lives through everything. They all work together. Yes, even that is being worked together by God. Notice number four. Number one, we know. Number two, all things. Number three, work together. Number four, for good. They're worked together for good. God has your highest good in mind. If you want to, you can turn with me, but I'll read it to you in Jeremiah. If you want to turn back to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. The children of Israel are captive under the rule of Babylon. They're paying the price for their sinful decisions, their idolatry, their, their lack of the true worship of God. They, they, are, they, they didn't give the land rest. They were greedy for money and idolatrous. And yet in the midst of their pain and in the midst of their difficulty, here's what God tells them, Je Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. What's true for the nation of Israel in the old covenant is multipl multiplied true for you in the new covenant. How much more, the Bible says, through the blood of Jesus Christ, does God care for you and love you and have thoughts towards you that are good and not evil to give you a future and a hope? That's what Paul says here. God's working all things together for what? Good. Even if you don't see it today, it's for good. He tells the children of Israel, I love you. Even in your time in Babylon, it's going to turn out for good. You're going to make it through. I'm going to use this in your life. It's for good. You're going to be better because of it. That's the word of the Lord to someone today. You're going to be better because of the trial in your life. For someone else, the word of the Lord is you're already better because of the trial that God allowed into your life. You're already better. You're already growing in the grace and the mercy and the love. of. You're a different person because of the difficulties you've endured through life, maybe even starting as a very young child. There's things in our lives we just can't choose and we have no control over where we were born, to whom we were born, where we would be educated, our economic status, and there's some things we just can't choose for ourselves. And yet God uses them. We can't choose the kind of stuff that's gonna come into our lives. We can't choose whether someone likes us or hates us. We can't choose whether someone's going to help us or hurt us. We can't choose whether someone's going to be loyal or betray us. Those things are outside of our control, but they're not outside of God's control. We're not just victims of circumstance. We're not victims at all. We are victors. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he is working out things in our lives and reminds us today that he loves us and that he cares for us, that we are so thankful for his faithfulness. Number five, and finally, it says that we know that all things work together for good, notice, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. This promise is not for everyone. 
This promise is not for everyone. It's only to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. It's only for those that have a relationship with the one true God by faith in Jesus Christ. Not just anybody can claim this promise. Not just anybody can say, well, you know, when tough times come, I'm going to get the Bible off the shelf finally. I'm going to go to my favorite verse and say, okay, it's okay. Everything's going to be work. No, no, this is only for those that love God. This is only for those that are called according to his purpose. Now, it is available to everyone that if today you would repent of your sins and submit your life to God, it could be that the very pain you're experiencing today is God getting your attention so that you will come to a place where you finally surrender your life, you will finally submit your life, and you will have the, the great exchange happen where it's his forgiveness for your sinfulness. It's his life for your death. It's his heaven for your hell by faith in Jesus Christ. But this isn't for everyone. You know, think of it this way. Some of you can think back to the days when you weren't following God. You know, for someone that we might consider an unbeliever, someone that's not connected to God. They watch the news. Uh, they experience life. They, they, all they can do is see randomness and chaos. There's just really no meaning to everything. You know, they might see some news story. Oh, oh uh, there's a declaration that Jerusalem is, na- is, is the official capital of Israel and immediately have political ramifications in an unbeliever's life. That statement wasn't political. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Jerusalem has been always the capital of Israel, not just 1948, but long before that. It's, oh, it's in the Bible. But an unbeliever, they go, oh, this is crazy. This is unbelievable. There's some kind of economic downturn. And automatically there's this sense, oh, I'm losing everything. But for the believer, it's not losing everything. Because we know life is more than money and the economy. But for someone that doesn't, isn't connected to God, it's just randomness and chaos and confusion. So what does a person do? And now I know for some of you listening in right now, whether you're here or you're out on the radio, I'm going to speak directly to you, and it's going to be like an like x-ray of your heart. It's going to be an x-ray of your heart. Even though I don't know you, God knows you. And here's what happens. When you see the randomness and chaos in this world, you immediately try to take control. You try to take control. One way that you take control is you create a religion that gives you comfort. Like, you see randomness and chaos, you go, oh, it's just evolution. It'll get better. Really? Evolution? Evolution. You really believe that everything started with an explosion? That explosion brings order? Like an explosion, you you really think that there you were in a blob of ooze that was created by who knows what, just some explosion, and then up popped an eyeball, and before you know it, that was you? That do you really think that, that, that explosions create order and not chaos? And by the way, by the way, who created the explosion? Who created the elements to create this explosion? Like, where does it end? That just brings more confusion, doesn't it? Not less. It doesn't explain things. It doesn't explain the reality of the chaos in your life. That there was that explosion in your life, that family situation, that work situation. It just exposed like a bomb in your family. And what did it do? Did it create order? No, it created chaos. You see, you create a religion. It may not even be evolution. You could say, well, you know, I just believe that God, everybody's going to stand before God. Everybody's going to stand before God, even people that hate him. Everybody gets the same thing, even the people that reject God, even the people that mock God. Everybody gets the same thing. You begin to, you begin to create things where you take the sovereignty of God upon yourself and just, I'll control it. I'll control my own destiny. If you go through any business section of a bookstore or Amazon, you'll see there are so many books and it's even creeped into the church, you know, just control of your life, take control of your destiny, everything. You can control everything and you're reading it and then some of you may even wake up in the morning and you have up on your, on your mirror, I am the captain of my ship, the controller of my destiny. Really, what happens when a big storm comes? I'm the captain of my ship. Okay, I get it. You're traveling along. You've got the ship of your life. You're, you're controlling it, and you're telling where to go, and you're driving the thing. What happens when a storm comes? I'm the captain of my ship, I said. Hey, what happens when a storm destroys your ship? What are you going to do, captain? Yeah, you need a captain outside of yourself, don't you? It doesn't make much sense to be the captain. You know, that, that philosophy sounds good when life's going the way you want it to go. What happens when it doesn't go the way you want it to go? What do you do then? What happens to the sovereignty of self when you realize you have no control over your life? 
None. Well, God introduced himself to us as the God who is sovereign, not the sovereignty of self, that he's the captain, and that he works all things together for good that those that love him. It's a love relationship. Those that are called according to his purpose. You see, unbelievers see chaos and craziness, but believers see the sovereignty of God. They see purpose. They have hope. There is purpose in your trial. God is going to work things together for good. If you know Jesus Christ, you could even say this is purposeful. My life is full of purpose. As painful and as hard and as difficult as it might be, I don't understand it. I don't understand why. I hate sin. I hate the ramifications of sin, but I love God and I submit my life to him as a faithful creator. And I live my life by faith. That's what faith is. Faith is believing the unseen, the things not yet revealed. Jacob learned this lesson. Jacob. We meet Jacob early on in the scriptures, but by the time we get to the end, remember we've looked closely at Joseph's life a couple times. From chapter 37 or so to 50, we've got Joseph's life. But you know who Joseph's dad is? Jacob. So what Joseph was going through, Jacob was going through. Different side of the coin. And Jacob learned this lesson well. He actually learned it the hard way. He learned that there was purpose in his trial, though. He learned it the hard, the hard way. He had to go the long way around. I don't know how many of you are one of those folks that need to learn things the hard way. But if you have to learn things the hard way, God will take you all the way down the road of hard and difficult. You don't, I would just say you don't always have to learn things the hard way, but we do too often. Anybody amen that? Because I'm one of those guys, unfortunately. I, I tend to learn things the hard way. But I have to say, once you learn it, it sticks. <laughs> it's like, okay, Lord, that's a good one. I should have just believed you on your word, but it, it is. So God is teaching us. So Jacob's that way. We find Jacob in a time of his life, around chapter 42 of Genesis, where he's reaping the harvest of his sinful mistakes of his younger years. So he's come to a place where his son Joseph is gone. His son Reuben has been disgraced. His son Judah has been dishonored. His daughter Dinah has been defiled. His son Simeon is in prison. And his wife Rachel is gone. On top of all of this, there's a famine in the land. He's facing the reality of starvation, where there's no food or water in the land. And yet there's more, if that wasn't enough in his life. He gets word from the second in command in Egypt. I want you to send your son Benjamin to me. And those of you that know Jacob's story, Benjamin's the little guy that took over his place in his heart for Joseph. He loves Benjamin. This little guy's precious to him. And he's thinking, how in the world does a guy in Egypt know about Benjamin? I'm not giving Ben. What, what? And you can imagine the kind of... The kind of consternation that's in his mind. There's no way. This is it. And listen to what he says in Genesis 42, verse 36. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin. And here's how he concludes it. All these things are against me. And that's how he felt. All these things are against me. He can't see any possible positive resolution in all the difficulties in his life. All these things are against me, which is also leads him to the conclusion that God is against him. God is against him. But he was wrong. His feelings were real, but they weren't telling him the truth. He was wrong. Not only were the things in his life not against him, but neither was God. And we too make the mistake when we conclude that God is not, not in all of these situations in our lives. That these things weren't against Jacob and they're not against us. These things and many more are in the hand of God being worked out for his good and for the good of his family. These things and all in your life are being worked out for the good and the good of your family, even if they're not good in and of themselves. You know, that person that's against you, God is going to work that out. That family you're not connected with, God is going to work that out. That, that situation where you're having a hard time at work, God is going to work that out and work them together for what? Good, not bad. And God is not against you today. And neither are there situations in your life as heavy as they are and as hard as they are and as difficult 
Some things are going to be really sour in life, even to the taste bitter. You're going to face things in life that you cannot explain. Neither can you understand. I mean, I think of, I think of my own life. If there are some things in my life that, like if you came up and shared some of the things in your life, I, I just, my heart would break with you, as it does when we pray together. But if I shared some of the things in my life that are going on right now, they're just crazy. They just don't make any sense. They, they absolutely don't make any sense whatsoever, and yet God has allowed them. God is using them. He's teaching us. He's growing us. You, you would be shocked. You would be shocked by the craziness that's in my life, but it's not for public. It's for the Lord, just like your stuff. It's not for public. It's for the Lord. He knows all about it. He's got knowledge that you don't even have yet of how he's going to work this out for good. You go, oh, Ed, I don't know. Maybe yours, but not mine. No, it's not true. It's true for you. It's true for me. God is working all things together for the good, for those that love him. Until he works them out, until we've experienced the good, we need to experience the goodness of God and trust him along the way. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. As a matter of fact, there are times in life, isn't it true, that the trials in your life cause you to press in harder, not softer? It's almost like, you know what? I was just telling a brother right after service earlier. He says, no, no, the devil wants you dead, but we're going to kick the devil in the teeth, man. You're still alive. Here you are. Suicidal three times in the last nine months. But he's standing right here. We're praying. He's alive. He's alive. Why? What the devil means for evil, God is going to turn around for good. And this guy's testimony is only going to grow in incremental ways to give God the glory so that one day he's going to be sitting across the table from someone that's suicidal. And he's going to say, I know how you feel. I've been in the pit myself. But there's hope even in the pit because God is there. He's in the pit. He's in the palace and everywhere in between. And what happened with Jacob? Well, he learned that God sent his son to Egypt ahead of him the hard way. I mean, obviously, if God's going to ask us, send your kid to Egypt, you're going to put him on a plane and to a nice hotel. That wasn't the way Joseph did. Joseph went all through all this. So what he could say at Genesis 50, 20 was what? What you meant for evil, God meant for good, to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. That's the heart of God, to save many people. God's working things out together in the right quantities, the right amounts, the right mixing, the right heat, so that he gets the glory. And everyone said at the end of this series, amen. amen. We're done. We're done. We're not done with worshiping God, but we are done with this little series that the Lord's used to encourage us. So would you just lift your hand? Let's pray for this series. Let's just lift your hand and let's just pray. God, we just pray and we, we ask, you know, by, by, um, you know, by symbol, by symbolism, we just lay hands on these series of studies. The thousands of times they've already been watched and listened to. The, the thousands of times that people have responded and shared it with someone else. We, we pray by faith and what our desire is to have a book developed and, and just to put it in our hands and we might be able to minister to people. And so by faith, we ask for your spirit. Uh, to, to go forth. But more than anything, as, as we lay hands on these series of Bible studies, Lord, we just pray they would take root in our hearts because the word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we just know that you're at work in our lives, you haven't abandoned us, and you're going to use these things for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.